Hey guys, this is Doug Perry from fellowshipofthemartyrs.com. I want to talk to you today a little bit about the way of the master. Um, I want you to understand that uh, I do this with love and care and concern and I don't have any personal vendetta or grudge against anybody. Uh, I know that there's fruit there. I know that people get saved. The problem that I have is they're saying that they're doing something that they're not doing. They're saying that this is the way of the master. That, that showing people the Ten Commandments, exposing to them their sinfulness, and getting them to agree that they're sinners and that they need hell is what the Lord did. And that's not at all the case. That's, that's just really, really shortchanging the power of God. Let me read you the story. A lot of times they refer to the woman in Samaria at the well and that that's what Jesus did. He convicted of her, of her sinfulness and she repented and came to Christ. And, and Let me read you the story though. <clears throat> this is from John chapter 4 verses 1 through 30. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized but his disciples. When, when the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once again uh, to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. Uh, that's around noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy some food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans, much less a man talking to a woman at a well like this. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. His cup's never going to run dry. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Okay, now here's the point. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. In fact, uh, the fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said, just said, is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming, and has now come, when, a true worshipers, when, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. <clears throat> Let me read on verse 39. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. She went back to the town and told everybody. Uh, so, so when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the Lord. In verse 28 it says, Then, uh, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? They came out of town and made their way toward him. Okay. The point is, Jesus did not read her the Ten Commandments. Anybody could have read her the Ten Commandments. Anybody could have gained some mental assent from her that she had violated the Ten Commandments. That is not salvation. Mental assent that Jesus is the Christ, or mental assent that he existed, or that the Bible is real, that is not salvation. He wants to be Lord, and that requires faith, not just in a, a mental agreement. If you just run down a list of the Ten Commandments and say, are you a thief, are you a liar, are you an adulterer? Yeah. Are you going to hell? Yeah. 
Well, what do you want to do about it? Well, I, I don't want to go to hell. Okay, well, where's the power of God in that? She said, I know you're a prophet. Not because he asked her if she had sinned, but because he told her what her sins were. Because he told her the secrets of her heart. He told her things that he was not supposed to know. And that is how she, he, she knew that he was a prophet. And that is what energized her to go tell people, come and meet this man who told me things that nobody knows. That's the power of God. In, Galat in 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 7. But mark this, there will be... I bet I'm not even in frame anymore because the whole thing drifted, didn't it? But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. My point is simply this. Anybody, any disciple, anybody trained by way of the Master could have walked up to the woman at the well and said, have you ever sinned? Have you ever told a lie? Have you ever killed anybody? Have you ever committed adultery in your heart? Well, then you're going to hell. That would not have driven her back to the town to draw a crowd and many people get saved. That would not impress her with the power of God. What Jesus gave her was a word of knowledge. It's one of the gifts of the Spirit. It's active. It's for today. And what Jesus did was tell her stuff about herself that only God knew. That she knew Jesus should not have known. And that convinced her that the power of God was on him. That's what we're supposed to be walking in. That's the way of the Master. If you want to bring people to salvation, walk up to them, tell them what demons are messing with them, tell them the secrets of their heart as the Lord gives you, tell them that he loves them, tell them that their daughter's going to get out of jail in three weeks, whatever. Show them the power of God and then let him do the rest of the work. That's our inheritance. That's what we're supposed to be walking in. That's the way of the master. A mental ascent, a checklist that anybody could do, that a trained monkey could read down and, and overcome objections is not a debate. It, it, it's a debate in man's terms. It's a debate the way men do things. The, athe the atheist argument, the rational response guys uh, debate with the, with the way the master guys was sickening. Sickening. Because it was entirely flesh. It was entirely man. It was entirely made up pictures of crocodiles and whatever. You know, far better far better to say somebody walk down the aisle let's get them healed right now and then show me then show me that God's not real that's what it's supposed to be that's what we're supposed to be walking in the great commission at the end of Mark says how we'll be able to know he says go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe in my name. They will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. We're supposed to be walking in that stuff. There are people walking in all that stuff. I have examples of that stuff in my life and the people around here. What about you? Do you have a form of godliness, but you're denying the power thereof? Or is it all about mental assent? Is it all about just agreement with a principle? Or is it about faith in a living God that's walking with you and holding your hand all the time? That's the way of the Master. For a lot more on this kind of stuff, visit fellowshipofthemartyrs.com. Thanks.